Our text this morning is Daniel 5. We'll be reading the whole chapter. If you need to take a seat, that's okay. But if you can remain standing, uh, that would be good. Verse 1. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. And then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems, were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems, now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed. And whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up. And whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne. And his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind. And his mind was made like that of a beast. And his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and, and this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed. 
many, many, tekel, and parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Many, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. This is God's holy word. May he add his blessing to it. You can be seated. And let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we look to your word, we, we are conscious of our need. I'm conscious, Lord, of my need for you uh, to help me to preach this text. Lord, there is so much in here that is profitable. All of Scripture is profitable. All of Scripture is God-breathed and, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for training in righteousness, for all these things, Lord. We just pray, even as all the scriptures point to Christ, that we would see the glory of Christ even here in this passage. So Lord, be with all of us. Be with me as I preach and be with each one who hears. Lord, help us to honor your word. May you speak to us by your holy word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I mentioned last week that chapter 4 and 5 of Daniel, they come as the peak of a chiasm in the book of Daniel. Really the peak of a whole section. Uh, the dreams and the stories of chapters 2 through 7, they have their, their summit in these chapters here, 4 and 5. As a chiasm is, basically everything is parallel. The first thing uh, matches the last thing. And then it goes like that, kind of like a pyramid. Well here, 4 and 5 are the very top. And they contain one main lesson that we really, we really shouldn't miss. God rules the world. God rules the world. He even rules Babylon. That's been the lesson that we see in Daniel 4 and 5. God is the one true sovereign, and he's able to humble the proud rulers of this world. Chapters 4 and 5 are these parallel stories of Babylonian kings who both are faced with this lesson. But they, as they're taught the same lesson, they each experience different results. So we looked at Nebuchadnezzar being taught this lesson. Well, now we have Belshazzar is also taught this lesson. The, the different results are this. Nebuchadnezzar is humbled. He's humbled by God. And he comes to confess this truth gladly, that the Lord rules, that God rules the kingdoms of men. He worships the Lord in this confession. And the Lord restores him after his humiliation. Belshazzar, not so much. Belshazzar learns the same lesson, but for him it's too late. There's no restoration. He faces imminent judgment. Well, let's, let's begin with some context here. Who is Belshazzar, or Belshazzar? Historical records outside of the Bible were silent on him for some time, which led the theological liberals to, say, to, to come up with all sorts of theories about why Daniel as a book was wrong. Well, they, they have this king in here who's not even a real king of Babylon. Surely you can't trust the Bible. But like it is always with these things, time and truth march hand in hand. And as we follow God's word, we, we just have to wait. We say, we might not have some archaeology for this, but in time, I trust there will be. I'm, I'm standing on the rock of God's word. And just, just as these men were... Um, positing that this is not true, that Belshazzar didn't exist. Well, archaeology eventually it did start digging up things about this king, Belshazzar, who was a vice regent to a, another man named Nabonidus. Um, and so really, the, here's the, the lesson there is, if you find a problem in the Bible, just study harder and just wait. Just wait. And always trust that God's word will be vindicated. This, his word is true. Uh, in this case, that, that later elk archaeology came to find this, this name on many items from this very period. Uh, that there's this king named Belshazzar. Well, what about Nebuchadnezzar and his relationship to Belshazzar? Um, you might be confused by that because 
I mean, maybe you're not, but you see that he's described as his father. Well, we know in history that there's a few intervening kings in Babylon, and so that also caused people to want to clear this up. Uh, how could Belshazzar be his son, especially when Belshazzar is called Nabonidus' son? Well, it's really, it's really a problem of na ancient Near Eastern uh, terminology. You know, we talk about Father Abraham, we talk about our fathers, and we're referring to our predecessors. And it could, we could even be hopping a generation when doing so. And that's what I believe, and that's what many scholars would believe is happening here. That Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't have, wouldn't have been Belshazzar's actual uh, blood, bloodline father, but about probably his maternal uh, grandfather and his, his uh, predecessor to the throne. Uh, we learn as well about Belshazzar that he was the vice regent with his father, Nabonidus, which explains why he's second in command and why he can only offer to Daniel the position of number three. You could be the number th the third man. We learn about Nabonidus as well, that he was often on the fringes of Babylon, uh, conducting many wars and all these things, and he had his son stay home as kind of a homebody to watch the city of Babylon. And we know how that went, right? The, leave the son at home watching Babylon, and we see what happens. Uh, this also, another little, just to clear up a note before we really get into it, uh, the queen in the text is probably the queen mother. Probably the queen mother. I think some translations actually put queen mother there. Um, and really, that's where, that would explain a few things. Perhaps why she wasn't one of the wives and concubines at the party. You know, this is mom checking on Belshazzar after things go haywire, saying, I heard a ruckus down here, and, and uh, you, you're looking for some, some wise men? Let me tell you about a wise man. I know of one. Because my dad, Nebuchadnezzar, this would be the queen mother, would be the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. My dad, Nebuchadnezzar, he knew a guy. He knew a guy. He's got a guy for these issues. His name's Daniel. You should know about him. So this, as you see it, when, you know, when you look at these things and, and uh, you put them together with history, the, the Word of God and history fits perfectly together. It just takes a little bit of thinking, it takes a little bit of study, um, and it takes trust in the Lord's Word. Well, let's begin, let's begin uh, through the, the bulk of this text now. We're going to really, uh, I've, I've fallen into the, the preacher's trap of uh, alliteration. You know, you have to have a bunch of points, and sometimes you just can't help it. They all have to start with the same letter. So we're going to have four main headings. They all start with P, okay? Uh, the party, the paranormal, the prophet, and lastly, the penalty, okay? So the party, the paranormal, the prophet, and the penalty. So those will give you some bookmarks to, to kind of hang your thoughts on as we go through this. Our text begins with a party. And Belshazzar throws a howler of one. It says, King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. All of the lords are there. We learn his wives are there as well, his concubines also. Um, right away, we see a difference between him and Nebuchadnezzar. While Nebuchadnezzar was known for his military exploits and his building projects and all these things, what's Belshazzar known for? His drinking games. His drinking games, his parties. Uh, Belshazzar was a bit of a wine connoisseur, okay? A bit of a wino, perhaps. It says he drank wine in front of the thousand. It's kind of an interesting phrase, uh, almost like he's showing off. He's, he's at the front of the table saying, watch me drink all this wine, and, and here, have more wine. And he's, 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 a, he's a real party animal, it seems. Well, he tastes the wine, and immediately he has an idea. He says, oh, let's take this up a notch. We, this is great. This is great wine. We want to take it up a notch. It, this is party time. We're not going to stop with one glass. I want to, I want to drink this out of something really special. Verse 2. Belshazzar, when he had tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. And no sooner did he say that than it was done. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. This is a sick scene. Don't miss the high-handed, uh, basically, arrogance of the taunt that Belshazzar is giving to the God of heaven, to the Lord. He's, he's taunting the God of Israel. 
you know, this by drinking out of these holy glasses, he's essentially saying, uh, our gods defeated your gods. They defeated your gods. And we are actually going to take the elements of worship for your god, and we are going to offer a toast to Bel and to Marduk and to all of our gods, these gods that are nothing. He, this is a proud man. A proud man is that he's a drunkard, he's a proud man, but we see that this is a trajectory of sin. He goes from pride and drunkenness to outright sacrilege and blasphemy. And then is into an idolatry as well. He's an idolater. He begins in pride, leads to sacrilege, and in the end he finishes with idolatry. Now this is a good note for us right now. Sin that is not repented of doesn't just go away. Okay, you have a small sin, um, and if you just say, I'm going to let that, leave that well alone, it will not stay alone. Sin begets more sin. It's like rabbits, okay? I just have a couple rabbits in my backyard eating my garden. It'll be fine. No, sin begets more sin, okay? Uh, or to use another analogy, another garden one, it's like weeds. You know, you, whenever you go out to your garden, you pick up some small weeds, uh, you, you know, you're, you're preserving the health of that garden. But what happens if you just leave it alone? Say, you know what, those weeds are small. Those are small. Well, pretty soon you're going to have you're going to have knee-high weeds. Gonna, your fruit is going to be choked right out. Your, your vegetables will be gone. Well, this is this is Belshazzar. He is not. He's unchecked in his sin. He's unchecked in his pride. Unchecked in his his drunkenness, and it leads to sacrilege. He gets more and more ideas of how he can sin. He's an inventor of evil. He's an inventor of evil. Romans 1:18 to 32. It really shows us this type of progression. Uh, let me read a little bit from Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. So they were without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So you notice at first... Uh, you're suppressing the truth. You're not agreeing with God. You're not giving thanks to God. Well, soon you have a dark and foolish heart. It goes on. It says they claim to be wise. They become fools. Then they exchange the glory of God for images. They become idolaters. Therefore, God then gives them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And it goes on. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions and to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. It even illustrates the sins of homosexuality um, and all these things. And you say, there's a slippery slope that begins by failing to give thanks to God, by, by being proud, by being self-sufficient, by saying, I don't need you, God. And it leads to a darkened heart. It leads to foolishness. It leads to being given over to all kinds of sin until you're unrecognizable, until you have a debased mind. And, and then it goes on until you start inventing ways of doing evil. You know, you begin by denying the truth, suppressing it, uh, but it's an awful progression that leads in the end to a debased mind. Here we see in Belshazzar this pride, this sacrilege, this idolatry on display. And we might ask, what will God do to this arrogant king? What, is, what would God do to such an arrogant king? Or more broadly, what will God do to nations like this? What will God do to a nation that flaunts the God of heaven? That taunts the God of heaven? That says no to him, that worships idols? That worships themselves? What will God do? Well, you might remember our study of Habakkuk. You remember Habakkuk? pretty much asked that very same question. When God told him that he was going to send the Babylonians to deal with Judah's sin, and, and Habakkuk was dismayed by this, and he says, how could you use these wicked people? How could you deal with them? These people are horrible. Don't you know they're horrible? What are you going to do about that, Lord? He lamented it. He says in Habakkuk 1, therefore, talking about Babylon, therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. 
Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? And then God responds to Habakkuk, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. And then the very next phrase, Yea, also, this is in the King James, gives you a better idea of the, what it means here. Yea, also, because he transgressed by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home. You think, why is God bringing up wine in the middle of talking about Babylon? Babylon's this proud, this proud, this proud nation characterizes this man, this fisherman who gathers all the nations. And now he says, and also, he transgresseth by wine. He sins by wine. He's a proud man. He doesn't keep at home. He goes all over the world to gather nations. And we talked about that even then, that the Lord was showing Habakkuk many years before what Babylon would be. And God knew that drunkenness would be a part of Babylon's sin package. Okay, that this is going to be their Achilles heel. This is going to be part of what leads to their downfall, their pride, their arrogance, and their their rampant drunkenness. It actually is going to lead to their downfall. And that was an encouragement to Habakkuk. He says, you need to live by faith. I know about these guys. So you ask the question, what will God do to these arrogant kings? What will God do to arrogant nations that reject him? Live by faith. You need to live by faith. God knows about all of their sin. God even knows how he is going to humble them. The exact problem, their weakness, that he will that he will take them on. While Belshazzar was taunting the Lord of hosts, he was raising a toast to his gods with the holy vessels of the sanctuary. What could go wrong? Well, let's lead to the second point, the paranormal. The party, the paranormal. Immediately, we read, immediately the fingers of the human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall. For all of the disturbing dreams that Nebuchadnezzar had, he never experienced a nightmare quite like this, did he? Belshazzar isn't dreaming either. He's living this horror movie. He's living this. It's a freaky scene. It's super disturbing. I, I remember when I first heard this story, I thought, that's intense. I, you know, you, if you're a sci-fi writer, if you're a horror movie writer, you can hardly come up with something that's that freaky is this random hand writing unintelligible words on the wall right at the moment when you've taunted the God of heaven. And Belshazzar, he certainly thought this was freaky. Look at his, look at his, um, his response in verse 6. Then the king, uh, so, so just back a little bit, the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. Okay? In the King James as well, this, I just, you know, it's a great phrase in the, in the original, in the Aramaic. And we say here, his limbs give way. But really it's the knots, and this is what it says, this is really what it literally says. The knots of his loins were loosed. The King James says, the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. Now, that's an evocative picture, isn't it? You think, this guy, he's going boneless. Or perhaps other things are happening that are quite embarrassing, right? We don't know exactly what's happening, but Belshazzar is afraid. He is absolutely terrified. Absolutely terrified. He's not doing well. This has already gone from a scene of pomp and pride already to a humiliating moment, hasn't it? In a quick moment. The king is already humiliated. Even before the judgment falls on him, God is already humbling this arrogant king. There are some sins that God doesn't give you even a moment before you experience the punishment of it. And apparently this is one of them. You, you taunt the God of heaven and you are immediately a wet noodle. God immediately uh, answers him. It's all well and fine until the hand starts writing on the wall, right? But what would you do? What would you do if something like this happened? Belshazzar does what he probably always does, and what all the kings before him seem to do. Call the wise guys. Okay? Who are you going to call? you got to call the wise guys. He yells for help. Uh, in verse 7, the king called loudly 
to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. And yet we soon find that they have no answer for the king. In verse 8, that all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. Again and again, just notice this, again and again, the Babylonian kings turn to fools for their wisdom, don't they? Again and again. All the king's counselors and all the king's men could not put Belshazzar at ease again. Okay, why do they constantly turn to these fools for wisdom? Time and again, they always forget to go to Daniel, don't they? They always forget to talk to the Hebrews. They always go to their own men, and it always comes up empty. We say, why do they do that? Well, perhaps we should ask that of ourselves, of our own nation, of our own people. This is what people do. This is what people do. You know, people don't always, they might say they want the truth, but a lot of people don't really want the truth. They want to hear what would comfort them. They want to hear what they want, what they already want to hear. What, what is smooth words. Think about the fools that even our country we've turned to at times. Have you seen the experts that our governments call forth and that our world willingly listens to? Think about it. We platform children to yell at us about climate change. Right? We, we say, let's listen to these people. Let's listen to this 15-year-old yelling at us right now. We turn to fools. We get sexually perverse people to be our health secretaries and all these things. We, we invite them in to teach us. We listen serenely to the emperor who has no clothes on. And we clap our hands and we say, very wise, very good. We're foolish, right? Western nations around the world, people are foolish. We're always, we always pursue and trust our experts who are wrong and again and again and again. We turn to fools to solve our problems. And, and that's what Belshazzar is doing here. Just like Nebuchadnezzar before, before him, we call the wrong guys all the time. We call the wrong guys all the time. It's because, like we read in Romans 1, our hearts have been darkened. We, claiming to be wise, have become fools. And that's it's because it's, it's not an intellectual problem, first and foremost. First, it's a sin problem. And then it's an intellectual problem. You know, we, we reject God, and then we start listening to kids on climate change. Then we start listening to all sorts of debased and wrong things from our health authorities. And we, we don't know how to think anymore when we reject God. Well, this is where things in our passage here, they take a turn. Perhaps for the better, it would seem. The queen, the queen mother, that is, she must have heard about all this commotion downstairs. And so she comes in. It says in verse 10, The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall. And the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. Pull yourself together, son. She then gives Belshazzar what she thought would be good news. Okay, maybe it doesn't occur to her that the writing on the wall might be bad news. She says, this is great. I know someone who can interpret that for you. Everything will be all better, son. Clean yourself up again. Pull yourself together. Maybe have a seat. You need a glass of water. Um, just, you need to call Daniel. You need to call Daniel. There's a man. And this leads us to our next point. The prophet. Okay? So we've gone from the party to the paranormal. Now we're looking at the prophet. Verse 11, there is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. The queen is right here. There is a man through whom God reveals mysteries. Now what do you call a person like that? A prophet. There's a prophet in town. One of God's prophets is in town. Notice how Daniel is described. In him there's light, there's understanding, there's wisdom, 
There's an excellent spirit. There's knowledge. There's an ability to interpret, to explain, to solve problems. This is actually kind of incredible. In the course of my study, I saw some point out that these descriptions match the descriptions of the Lord Jesus in Isaiah 11. Let me just read you a verse from Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. In this way, Daniel as a prophet is foreshadowing the great prophet to come, isn't he? There is a man. There's a man. He's foreshadowing Christ. You know, we come into a world filled with really sin and blasphemy, not unlike Belshazzar, right? We come to a bunch of tin pot Belshazzars who, who are working with less material but are no less proud, arrogant, blasphemous, idolatrous. And we, we tell these people, there's a man. There is a man who can solve these problems. There's a man that you need to know. His name is Jesus. He's the light. He's the truth. Listen to him. But here, back to our story, here at the end of Babylon, God gave the king a prophet. Belshazzar calls him in, and even here we can still see his pride. Look at Belshazzar's pride in verse 13 and 14. Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah? I have heard of you. We'll, leave it, we'll just leave it there for a moment. Notice what Belshazzar emphasizes about Daniel. Not that he was appointed uh, as a chief ruler of Babylon. Not that Nebuchadnezzar trusted him. Not that he was vindicated time and time again. None of that. Not that he's this sage, wise old man in Babylon. He emphasizes that Daniel was an exile. That Daniel was brought out of Judah. That Nebuchadnezzar had some kind of authority over him. You're that Daniel. You're that slave Daniel. You're that Hebrew Daniel that we captured. Belshazzar failed to learn the lesson that his father was taught. He failed to take seriously Daniel and his God. Nebuchadnezzar honored Daniel and worshipped Daniel's God. Belshazzar is unconvinced. He offers Daniel the same rewards if he can read the writing for him. And now let's look at Daniel's response to him. Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. You can keep your gold chain. You can keep your purple robes. You can keep your job. I don't, you're not, newsflash, spoiler alert, this whole role of third ruler is not going to last very long. Okay, I don't, I don't need that job. But, but Daniel's basically saying to him, listen, I don't need anything that you can offer. I am here, me being here is simply a grace to you to tell you what God says. You can keep it. I'll interpret the writing. I'll give, but before I do, let me give you a little history. A little history that you should not have forgotten. Daniel then goes on to tell Nebuchadnezzar and his humbling before God. He tells of this king who was far greater than Belshazzar and how God humbled him into the dust. He tells the whole story that we just read the last couple of weeks. And then comes the punchline, verse 22. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Though you knew all this, Daniel leans in, doesn't he? And he preaches. He exhorts him. He stands as God's prophet and declares, you knew all this. Don't play dumb that you just heard about this Daniel, that you didn't know that pride was a big deal, that, that you could just take these vessels and do what you want with them. You knew this. You knew this. Most likely his mother was Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, right? You know the story, Belshazzar. But yet you didn't humble yourself before God. Yet you did not humble yourself. Instead, it says in verse 23, you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. That's what he was doing. He was taunting the Lord. You have drank wine out of the holy things of the temple. 
And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, which again points to the foolishness of idolatry, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. See, it's, again, it's, what is his sin? Pride, sacrilege, idolatry. And there's no excuse. There's no excuse. You cannot plead ignorance before the throne of God. You knew all this, Belshazzar. He has no defense. He's without excuse. What about us? What about the world today? Do you have a legitimate excuse for your sin? The devil made me do it. I was born this way. Do you have a legitimate excuse? No, you don't. I don't. None of us do. Before the throne of God, we are left naked before the Lord to answer for our sins. We have nothing to hide ourselves in, in ourselves. Nothing at all. Can any of us defend any sin? Can you stand before God, make an excuse for your ingratitude, for your lust, for your idolatry, or for anything? None of us can. Well, this leads to the penalty. The fourth point. The penalty. Daniel reveals to Belshazzar what the writing is. Many, many, tekel, parson. He explains it as well, verse 26. This is the interpretation of the matter. Many. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. You know, you might wonder, why couldn't the other guys read that? You know, it, so it sounds like it was just written in normal Aramaic. But there's one thing you might not know about, about these Semitic languages. Um, they often don't have vowels, okay? And they're often written just, just with the consonants. And so you would have had just basically an M and an, an, M and an N, that's many. For Tekel, you'd have the three, T-K-L. And then for Parson, you'd have P-R-S, essentially. And, and those words can mean a few things. And they actually have to do with money, mostly. You know, this, the first one is a, is a mina. You've heard of a mina? And then we have a shekel, and then we have a half shekel, a divided shekel. So there's this, there's this division of, you know, okay, you've got a dollar, a dollar, a quarter, and a dime, we'll say. And you can see why his, why his uh, counselors were saying, I have no idea why we, I don't know what that means. We have, we have a descending order of money on the wall. But those words can also be, uh, they also could be, slightly different, and, and they can basically mean to count, to be numbered is the first one. And then tekel, you know, to be weighed. Shekel was, was, a, was a certain weight. And then the last one is to be divided, to be divided, or a half shekel, or it's a divided shekel. So you can see how Daniel comes in and says, no, 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 it's not just referring to the money, it's what the money was based on. This is referring to God has counted you. He's numbered your days. He knows this about you. He can give the interpretation. He's weighed you, and he's found that you are wanting. And he's now dividing your kingdom and giving it away. Interestingly, the word for divided, the P-R-S word, could also be the word that makes up Persia, the Persians as well. So this news must have hit Belshazzar like a ton of bricks. Think about it. Nebuchadnezzar was given 12 months of quiet from warning to fulfillment. Do you remember that? He has this terrible dream. Daniel exhorts him to repent, and he has 12 months of quiet. And he gets worse and worse, and then he is then humbled by the Lord. And the judgment falls on Nebuchadnezzar. Well, not so with Belshazzar. The very same night. The very same night. And it's a stricter judgment. Right? Nebuchadnezzar was humbled by God and then restored, brought back again. Belshazzar was humbled old school. Okay, he was just destroyed. He said, this is coming on you. And, and Belshazzar, had, he was too late for him. You know, think about this. He had the privilege of having God's servant, God's prophet, standing before him, declaring the truth, giving him the warning of imminent judgment. 
But for him, it was too late. It was too late. He would not recover from his drunken stupor and respond. The judgment would fall that very night. The judgment was at the door. If you look into the history of this, while Belshazzar was partying, Darius the Mede was actually, and his Persian army, they were actually damming up the rivers of Babylon so that the water level would lower and they could walk through the, the water gates under the wall. And they were already taking over neighborhoods while this party was going on. Even the secular history refers to that. That's how Babylon fell, during a drunken party, during a feast that the king was having. And he, before he even knew it was upon him, they were already taking over Babylon. Now, but think about this. How long did he live with Daniel right under his nose? With the, with the prophet of God, with the, with the man who could tell him the truth. How long did he live with these stories, uninvestigated? You know, he, there was grace given to this king. He had opportunity to repent, and yet he hardened himself to it. He never sought out Daniel. He didn't seek the truth. He didn't learn the lesson of his father. He went his own way. Well, to bring this to a close, I just need to ask, how about you? How about you? Have you come to humble yourself and seek the God of heaven? Have you repented of your sins and come to the Lord Jesus by faith for forgiveness, for new life, and for a new start? You know, we often think that we have all the time in the world to get right with God and to really be serious about our faith and all these things. But do you know that? You know, maybe Belshazzar thought, surely I'll have another day to figure this out. Maybe I'll be like Nebuchadnezzar, have 12 months. And maybe God will humble me just to bring me back again. But this is, this is, a, horror, this is a horror story for him. For him, it, it goes from bad to worse. He's rightly afraid. He's rightly trembling. Because not only is there a hand on the wall that wrote that message, but the judgment of God is falling on him that very night. There is grace extended to anyone who can hear the gospel, even right now. If, if someone hears the gospel, there is still time. You know, will you this moment his grace receive, we sound. Um, as it says in Hebrews 3.15, As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Judgment will fall. Judgment will fall. But will you be sheltered by the rock, who is Christ? And this is where the gospel comes in, right? This is where the gospel comes in. There is a savior. Daniel could have told Belshazzar about him. Daniel, it seems, had pointed Nebuchadnezzar to put his faith in the God of heaven. But what about you? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? You cannot hang on to anything, any excuse before God. Belshazzar had no excuse. Just like Daniel said to him, though you knew this, you kept on going. Or as it says in Romans 1, there's no excuse. You, we actively suppress the truth. So the gospel comes to us as an emergency. As, not, not as a, a little sales pitch to say, come, join, join this, vote for Jesus for president. You know, come and be part of his team, winning team. No, the gospel comes as an emergency saying, you are in imminent danger. Judgment will fall. It might not fall tonight. But it will fall. Will you run to Christ? Will you be sheltered in Him? Let me give a word to the kids here today. Kids, don't follow the path of Belshazzar. He failed to learn the lessons taught to his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Whatever faith Nebuchadnezzar had, it must not have got passed down, did it? It didn't really get passed down. He wandered away from the faith. He wandered away. He never followed it. And here's the warning for kids. Don't think that you'll be saved and go to heaven just because your parents are Christians. Okay? You need to respond to the gospel yourself. You need to believe the gospel yourself. You need to repent and believe in Jesus. So trusting in Him, that's something that each one of us is responsible for. Nebuchadnezzar didn't didn't get it right and then pass that on to every other king or every other son or child. Each one needed to meet the God of heaven. So really for all of us, don't wait another day. Don't waste another second. 
repent, believe. This text is an emergency text. Run to Christ. But lastly, I want to finish with something that's a little less specific to Belshazzar. And, and a little less specific to your personal salvation, personal judgment. This text tells the tale of the fall of Babylon. We might lose that in all the excitement of this story. But this is a momentous event. Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen. The golden head of that great statue has been lopped off in a night. It happened suddenly during a party when you least expect it. And it happened supernaturally with this writing on the wall, this re revelation of what would happen. It happened secretly as the Persians snuck into the city. And in a moment, it was all over. The king was dead. Darius the Mede was the new king. And enter the silver kingdom, the, the reign of Persia. So this is a momentous event. Now think about this. This is the nation that Habakkuk so dreaded. This is the nation that the world dreaded. This is the nation that all of Judah lamented. That there they are at the rivers of Babylon, weeping. And this is the moment of their enemies being destroyed, isn't it? Now, they're being destroyed by another set of enemies, but we'll see that it, it, things are different. But don't miss the victory of this passage. That here's Daniel, probably 80 years old, witnessing the vindication of his people, witnessing the people that destroyed his homeland getting their comeuppance, getting their judgment. Here he is watching the demise of them. Remember, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. As it said to, as God said to Habakkuk, wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for the Lord. If it seems slow, wait for the Lord. So what about the proud empires of our day? What about the proud leaders of our day? What about the governments? What about the culture that runs headlong against Christ? What about the persecution against Christians? Will they be forever devouring God's people? Will they forever devour all that's good? No. Wait for it. Live by faith. The original Babylon fell. And every downstream Babylon, every beastly kingdom will fall. That's the message. That's the message of Daniel 4 and 5. God rules the kingdoms of men. He sets them up. He takes them down. He's the sovereign. He's the ruler. Do you see how that's encouraging? Do you see how this crazy, scary, freaky night is encouraging to Daniel, encouraging to us. God is sovereign over history. The people of God will look upon the vindication of their God and their faith. You can't mess with the Lord forever and get away with it. You can't mock Him forever. The Lord sits enthroned in the heavens, and He will mete out judgment. Judgment Day is a real thing. It's something we don't preach enough. It's something that the world needs to hear. That there is a judgment day. There's a judgment day. Each of us will stand before the throne of God. And what will save you then? Like, we, like I said earlier in Psalm 130. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful phrase, but think about the weight of it. If God were to count, or if God were to mark our iniquities, who could stand? Who could stand? But with the Lord there is forgiveness. So therefore he is feared. You see, the world needs to hear that. That if you are on your own standing before the, the throne, you will melt into a puddle. You will not stand. You will be judged. You will not make it. But with the Lord there is forgiveness. And then you can stand. Isn't that amazing? That you could come into the throne, of, the throne room of God as his child. That's the grace of the gospel. Grace that we see perhaps Nebuchadnezzar received, but Belshazzar does not receive it. You see how God is sovereign over those things. One king is chosen, one is left. One king is eventually softened to the gospel. The other king is hardened. Who are you? Who are you? Are you going to be softened or hardened? This is an encouragement to the people of God. You know, you think about suffering 
we're not in Babylon, we're not necessarily suffering in that extent, but in a very, very real way, we're living in a, a land that, that views us as hostile, that is growing in hostility towards the church. Uh, I mean, we, we thank the Lord that there's things like a recognition that churches are charitable, and some of those things still remain. But the writing's on the wall, so to speak, that very much the Christian faith is viewed as divisive, as hostile, as something that really ought not to be tolerated. Um, and so we might be going through more and more as the years go on. And what will be our comfort? Our comfort is that our God is with us, and that our God is sovereign, that our God rules history, that every proud empire, every person, every nation that raises themselves up against the Lord will be brought down. God will vindicate his people. This is what Paul says. He says, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. You see, a Christian is always victorious, even in the middle of what seems to be a defeat. I, I can't remember who said this, but Christianity advances by a series of cleverly designed defeats, okay, or cleverly disguised victories that are disguised as defeats. All right, it's, it's a mystery how the, God advances the church through persecution, through suffering. Paul says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So we do not lose heart. As we look at these chapters in Daniel, learn the lesson of these chapters. God rules the world. God loves his people. God will humble the proud. If judgment on our enemies, enemies seems slow, wait for it. Live by faith. Learn the lesson. Don't fear the kingdoms of this world. And on the personal level, don't build your own proud kingdom. Don't build your own proud kingdom. This is what Nebuchadnezzar finished his chapter with. He praised, and this is what I'm calling you to do. Listen to Nebuchadnezzar telling you to do this. Praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven. For all His works are right, and His ways are just. And those who walk in pride, He is able to humble. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You for the warning of this chapter as we see uh, the Judgment Day is coming. And we pray, Lord, that we would uh, take the offer of the gospel seriously, that anyone who hears this message, even perhaps online, that they would uh, take seriously the call of the gospel to turn away from their sins, to seek you, to seek your mercy, uh, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be hidden in him, the rock, on the day of judgment. Lord, we pray that uh, you would vindicate your people, that every proud enemy of yours, Lord, would be humbled. Lord, we do want to see them humbled and restored like Nebuchadnezzar. But Lord, maybe you would just judge them and humble them to the dust like Belshazzar. And either way, you are good. And we would join with the saints in saying hallelujah as you judge your enemies, as Babylon the Great is fallen. Amen.